Let us pray. Thank You, loving God, for blessing us with this morning, with the all the contributions that have come together of heart and soul and wallet to make this place be a place where we can gather for worship and caring for one another. We thank You for the love that we feel, for the encouragement we receive from one another. We thank You for the Word that comes to us through the many ages and is so relevant yet again today. We are thankful for that love as a gift to us and a gift we may share. And we pray for your inspiration to do just that. So as we are in this worship service together, let all of the words that we hear and see and read and pray and think, let them be sifted so the one word that you have for us the word for our lives is the word that comes through in this day and we take with us. And we pray as so many have done for ages that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts gathered here are indeed acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I really mean this when I say this. If I owe you money or an apology, please just tell me. <laughs> Some people have heard me say this before because I want to make clear with them, uh, I want to make sure that we are clear in our communications and in our open-heartedness in our relationship. The reality in my world is that I hope that there are very few, if any, resentments held against me. And I strive to ensure that my debts are managed and paid. Today we heard one of the shortest gospel readings in our 15-year history of Bloom in the Desert Ministries Sunday morning worship. Some might have said, I had to stand for that. <laughs> It is obviously talking about forgiveness. Now it comes with a parable attached, but I left that off this Sunday because in this passage, I think Jesus makes the point best. I will talk about the interaction in a little bit, and I hope that we will open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to another factor that functions in the forgiveness equation. Saying I forgive you is only half the action. The other words that need to be said or written are, I'm sorry. Now I'm realistic and experienced enough to know that not every act of forgiveness can be preceded by an I'm sorry. Sometimes individually realizing and naming and moving on from a hurt is the only available manifestation of forgiveness and forgiving someone who has not said, I'm sorry. However, my point today is that in healthy relationships between people and peoples as communities and nations, in order to spark the light of peace and forgiveness, it is the best practice for someone to say, I'm sorry. In our gospel passage, even though Peter asks about a sister or brother, we must remember that this was not a limiting question. The Greek word used in the text is about as broad a reference to humanity as is possible. Perhaps the only limitation is that it seems to infer some kind of relationship involved in family, community, national or ancestral connections. In our day and realm of knowledge, we could go so far as to say this is meant to be talking among earthlings. The numbers are meaningful too. The references to seven, 70 times seven. Let's remember that the number seven is a biblical literary device. It signifies completion and divine perfection. When we see the number seven, the job is done. So when Peter asks, how many times seven? It's a justifiable question. And it's a conclusion. 
Seven. In the literary communication of the day, Seven did a big job. But in a moment of reformational agitation, Jesus says divine perfection is not enough in human relations. We humans must go further to accommodate one another with love. We go multiples. We go 70 times seven. And in some translations, the text says seven times seven. But they pound the point home with this, whether it's seven times seven, or 70 times seven and saying it 10 times more, the point is being made with a reformational approach. The importance of going the full distance is not left to misinterpretation. We humans are called to offer so much love and forgiveness to each other that we exceed what is thought to be the capacity of divine perfection. Now, living practically is the telling evidence of our spiritual values. I am convinced that the Jesus teachings are the practical reality of the Christ inspiration. The effect of our spiritual mind and heart's understanding is more important than the content of our visions. I think that is why the teachings of Jesus are so practical. When you look closely at them, you can find that practicality at work. Read the Jesus sermons on the mount and on the plain. Sermon on the mount, where is it? Matthew. So therefore, sermon on the plain must be in Luke. And we find clear instructions for life when we read Matthew 25. And so I wonder when we read something like Matthew 25, how is it that the latest crop of evangelical leaders on television can sleep at night? Whatsoever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. One biblical and theological commentator I admire wrote recently about our current polarizing, unforgiving environment. Now, based upon my education and my observations, I think professors of and students of and commentators on history will tell us that the current polarizing, unforgiving environment is nothing new. We can find other times in history when the world seemed topsy-turvy and cries of all is lost were common. What I think is needed in our day is a greater understanding, perhaps a reaching back to an understanding, but a greater understanding now and an acceptance that the way to mitigate polarizing and unforgiving environments is for people to take responsibility in their parts for creating the situation. And then, when the situa where the situation is, do what we can to be instruments of peace. And many times that starts with coming to one's senses and saying, I'm sorry. The desire for forgiveness needs a shared ability to apologize. And the act of apology needs to be seen as a strength, not a weakness. In our day, it is more popular to mock someone who takes responsibility for hurting people and then admire someone for taking responsibility for their actions. In our day, people in power are able to hurt people without power and get away with it. When the powerless ask why or rebel, they are seen as troublemakers, not peacemakers. And the funny thing about that is that is exactly what happened to Jesus. When he started flipping the norms of the thinking of the day which cha and challenged the powers that be, he was rendered powerless and killed. Yikes! That's our model. Something that hovers in my mind when I think about forgiveness is that someone saying I'm sorry often makes forgiveness easier to come. Not always, but usually. But in my observations of church life in the past 15 years, I've noticed that it seems to be very hard 
for people to say, I'm sorry. Perhaps that should come to me as no surprise. In my experience of the business world, in my observation of the political world, it seems that saying sorry is reported more as a sign of weakness than integrity. Or to put it another way, perceptions of strengths are more valued than perceptions of integrity. In our recent national history, when President Obama tried to follow the leads of Gandhi, King, and Mandela by recognizing the harm our country's actions had brought toward other nations throughout history, it was not seen as moments of reconciliation and peacemaking. It was ridiculed as an apology tour over and over and over again. It seems that the bully is admired more than the peacemaker in our time, even when we know that bullies like war are not healthy for children and other living things. The societal admiration is a hindrance. This is, that societal admiration for bullying is a hindrance to our Christian mission to offering forgiveness. And maybe a secular professional can give us some good insight for our religious journey. Richard B. Jolson has been a clinical social worker, psycho psychotherapist, an educator, and an administrator since my senior year in high school, 1970. And he wrote recently in Psychology Today, just actually last January, he wrote this passage. A true apology is designed to repair both the relationship as well as the reputation of the wrongdoer. The guidelines for an effective apology are quite simple. Accept responsibility for the negative impact of your actions so that your apology will be sincere and then well received. I would offer a, just an insertion there. A sincere apology never includes the phrase, if I offended you. Number two, be specific if your apology, be specific in your apology so that you are directly acknowledging what you did wrong and not generalizing or being vague. Number three, be emphatic, as in let the offended person know. Be empathetic, sorry, be empathetic. You can be emphatically <laughs> empathetic. As in let the offended person know that you understand and appreciate the impact of your wrongdoing on them. And then for offer assurance that you will make every effort to ensure that your offensive words or actions will not be repeated. This hopefully will enable the hurt or offended person to not be wary of you and trust that the, the offense will not be repeated. I know I hurt you. I'm sorry. I hope to not do that again, I don't plan to do it again. Can we start over? But before an apology, it takes courage for someone to say to another person, to another someone, I feel hurt by what you did or said. And when someone says that to me and to you and to us and to our country, the proper response is not mocking or denying the hurt, even if we do not remember what happened, the first thing to say is, I'm sorry. And the good thing to come after that is, I forgive you. That's the beginning of process that can work on personal, community, corporate, national, and international settings and agendas. Some people know it and do it well. I hope more will learn it. And I think one day that will lead to the broad experience of peace so many of us hope and pray will become our reality. When we sing, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, this is the way it starts. The saying by an unknown source says, the first to apologize is the bravest, the first to forgive is the strongest, and the first to forget is the happiest. 
while I am not one to speak in such absolute terms, I think it is good for us to know that the bravery in an apology and the strength in forgiving and the happiness that comes with forgetting are effective values to cherish and seek. In our life together, these three will hinder anything from tearing us apart. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.